picture yourself as the conductor of an orchestra with each emotion playing a different instrument. How do you keep them all in harmony when the brass section of fear is blaring too loud and the strings of doubt are out of tune? Don't fret, maestro of your emotions, because today we're composing a symphony of emotional intelligence with crescendos of self-awareness and staccatos of empathy. So grab your baton or metaphorical conducting wand, strike up the band, and let's make some beautiful music out of your emotions. Welcome to Stop Doubting Your Dream. I'm your host, Jeff Meyer, and each week I'll give you practical steps to turn your dream into a viable source of income so you can live without regret, reshape your future, and create the meaningful change you want to see in the world, all without leaving your day job. Let's dive in. Welcome back. Today I want to talk about three things as we think about emotions, identifying them and managing them for our own benefit and for the benefit of our dream pursuit. Here are the three things I want to share with you today. All right? The importance of emotional intelligence has three foundational pieces that we're going to unpack. Number one, self-awareness. The ability to recognize your own emotions, your strengths, your weaknesses, values, the things that motivate you, and to understand how they affect others. Number two, not only self-awareness, but self-regulation. The ability to manage one's own emotions and impulses and to adapt to changing circumstances in a calm and composed manner that helps us move forward. And then finally, point number three, motivation. The ability to harness emotions, to use them as fuel to drive yourself toward achieving your goals and to persist in the face of ultimate setbacks. Self-awareness, number one. During a really pivotal time in my leadership at the church, I found myself at a crossroads. I was expanding my coaching beyond the church's walls. God had opened up doors of opportunity beyond the church walls, aiming to help a broader community, pastors, leaders, individuals, companies, organizations, but not everyone in the church was on board. Some influential members voiced their discontent, expressing concern about their pastor engaging in activities outside their familiar sphere of influence. I listened intently to their complaints, taking each one to heart. In spite of what some people have said about me, I actually do care. I tried tirelessly to win them over, to soothe their dissatisfaction, all while, as I learned later, neglecting my own voice in the process. It was a relentless cycle of seeking approval from those who seemed impossible to please. Yet amidst this turmoil, a whisper grew louder within me, a persistent feeling that something was amiss. I was carrying a deep-rooted sense of unease. It was only when I stopped, when I pause to reflect, to truly consider my emotions, to actually name them, that the fog began lifting. I realized that I was deeply unhappy. The pressure to conform to others' expectations clouded my judgment, leading me further down a path of discontent. And in the midst of all that, I had been believing a lie. Here is the lie. Pastors do not have the right to advocate for themselves. Their role is solely to take care of others. This realization was like a beacon in the darkness, illuminating the path to a deeper understanding of self-awareness. So that's the first thing we want to talk about today, self-awareness. You can see it in my story, hopefully. When we look at the, the way of Jesus and the the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, and we can learn um, a little bit about self-awareness. There's a particular story I'd like to direct you to. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. And Jesus says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, 
Let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck in your brother's eye. In this passage, Jesus uses a metaphorical illustration to emphasize the importance of self-awareness, I believe, before attempting to address the faults or issues in others. He highlights the, calls them hypocrites, the hypocrisy of trying to correct others while being unaware of one's own shortcomings. Jesus teaches that true leadership, effective guidance requires a deep understanding of oneself and a willingness to address one's own faults and weaknesses before helping others. The passage underscores the foundational role of self-awareness in leadership. We can learn so much from the way of Jesus, can't we? So let me show you an example here in this metaphor, as it applies to my own life. This passage really unearthed this part of my story. Let me share it for you today. I was facing criticism and pressure from influential members of the church regarding my coaching activities outside the church, right? Despite their complaints, I was focusing on trying to win them over and address their concerns without standing up for myself or advocating for my own needs or my own calling. This was the plank in my own eye. What a huge revelation for me. And the speck in others' eyes, their dissatisfaction with my actions, I was ignoring the plank in my own eye my own feelings of unhappiness and neglect and not being true to my own calling. Like the hypocrites in Jesus' teaching, I was prioritizing the needs and opinions of others over my own well-being and calling and sense of purpose. And I was not ultimately helping those other people. I was not helping them grow, find their own calling, which is my calling. I was not actually serving them well. Jesus' way encourages self-awareness and introspection, urging you to first address your own faults before attempting to correct others. So here's the application in my own leadership story. First, I needed to recognize and acknowledge my own feelings of unhappiness, and I needed to recognize and acknowledge my own misbelief, let's call it that, my own Misbelief that pastors should not advocate for themselves by taking the time to understand my own emotions and beliefs, I can better navigate challenging situations and lead with authenticity. So as we wrap up this first point, are there areas in your own life or leadership where you might be focusing on external expectations or criticisms while neglecting your own needs your own values, your own calling? How can you cultivate greater self-awareness to ensure you're leading from a place of authenticity and clarity? Number two, in terms of emotional intelligence and identifying and managing emotions, not only self-awareness, but number two, self-regulation. Now that we've explored the importance of self-awareness in our leadership journey, let's dive into the Next essential component of emotional intelligence. Just as a skilled sailor adjusts the sails to navigate rough seas, self-regulation allows us to steer through turbulent waters of emotions with grace and composure. So let's discover a little bit today the art of self-regulation, which can empower us to lead with resilience and authenticity. Number one, recognize and acknowledge your emotions. You know, whether it was feeling the pressure to please others or the sense of a nagging feeling that something wasn't right, I had to attune my heart, my mind to my emotional landscape. At this step, it's not always pretty, right? Yet it's important, as my daughter always coaches me, feel all the feels, she likes to say. Shine the light on them. Just recognize them and acknowledge them. You don't have to fix them at this step. Just Notice them like a cloud in the sky passing by. I'm feeling 
angry. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling excited. Recognize and acknowledge emotions. Number two, pause and reflect. In my story so far, can you see the importance of pausing and reflecting on your emotions? You know, through journaling, discussing with friends and accountability partners along the way, by taking the time to reflect, I was able to gain clarity on what was truly bothering me and why it was bothering me. And then I could move into step three, choose your response. So through my experiences with my own coach, I learned how to choose my response to my emotions. I didn't have to just go with the flow of the emotions that were being caused by my interaction with others. I could choose my response. This was huge for me. I learned a lot about breath work and speaking your truth calmly and assertively. These were powerful tools that allowed me to respond to the challenges that I was facing with grace and authenticity. And finally, the fourth point, seek support. Uh, finally, I was, I was willing to challenge deeply held beliefs because I sought out the help and support from my coach. When you have to challenge deeply held beliefs and have to challenge and stand up for your values in the face of obstacles and others who are pushing against you, you need support. We would practice conversations, prepared me to have those conversations. So make a commitment today to your own growth, to your own development. Self-regulation often involves seeking support from others. And an openness to this process will build resilience and it'll build determination. When I think of the life and ministry of Jesus, one story that kind of pops up for me is in Matthew 26. It's the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying to his father before his crucifixion, which is coming, and he knows he's going to be laying down his life. He experiences deep anguish and sorrow to the point of, the scripture tells us, sweating blood. The capillaries um, in his head uh, rupture because of his pain. Yet he, does, he demonstrates remarkable self-regulation and how he handles the intense emotional turmoil, turmoil. He feels all the feels, but he manages it in such a way that he keeps moving forward with what he knows he needs to do. Instead of lashing out or giving in to despair, Jesus prays to his father, saying, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Despite the profound distress, Jesus remains focused on his purpose and he maintains a sense of calm and surrender. He accepts his fate because it's his purpose to save the world. He accepts it with grace and courage, showing incredible self-regulation in the face of overwhelming emotions. So, doesn't this story serve as a powerful example of how self-regulation can help us navigate deep emotions and leadership? Like Jesus, we can learn to acknowledge our emotions, seek guidance and support, and ultimately choose a response that aligns with our God-given call, our values, and our purpose, even in the midst of the most challenging circumstances. So how can you cultivate a greater sense of self-regulation in your own life and leadership? What practices or approaches can help you respond to challenging emotions with grace and clarity, staying true to your values and your purpose? The third foundational component of emotional intelligence that we can identify and manage is motivation. So we've got self-awareness, self-regulation, and finally, motivation. Just as a sturdy mast keeps the ship moving forward, motivation propels us toward our goals, toward our aspirations, even in the face of obstacles. So let's uncover that harnessing power of motivation and see how it can fuel our leadership journey with purpose and perseverance. Number one, and I got seven points here, so strap in. Here we go. Um, when we think about motivation, number one, we think about identifying values and goals. 
in your story, think about what are your core values? For me, I have a core value of actually helping others realize their God-given call in the world. And it goes beyond the church walls. It's my life call. And working within a church is part of that, but it's not all of it. So this alignment of values and goals, it fuels my motivation. To this day, it's still fueling it. So identify values and goals. Number two, create a compelling vision. I think of how in my story, I have visualized a future where my coaching could reach a broader community. People within the church space, people outside the church space, people in neighborhoods, people in communities, people in businesses and organizations. And every time I sit with that vision, it creates excitement and purpose in my work. It keeps me going. Identify values and goals. Create a compelling vision. Number three, break down goals. I am constantly breaking down the dream into smaller, manageable steps. It is movement that motivates. It is movement that helps me make progress. The opposite is true as well. Lack of progress, just thinking about it always, not taking steps, sucks the life out of me. Inertia strips motivation. So break down the goals, take the next step. Number four, find intrinsic motivators. You guys, you cannot rely on someone else to keep you going. Sure, once in a while, we all need a kick in the pants, right? But overall, you will need to discover intrinsic motivators to stay in the game over the long haul that any dream pursuit requires. My motivation stems from intrinsic rewards, such as the satisfaction of seeing others light up when they get clear, seeing them pumped when they realize that they're free to pursue what God has given them to pursue. And when I take the requisite time to sit back and reflect on my own growth journey in pursuing this dream to help others achieve theirs, it really is exciting and motivating for me. I have learned so much. The personal growth I have experienced through coaching, wow, I am so grateful. Intrinsic motivators. Five, stay positive and persistent. Despite facing criticism and pressure along the way, I have overall... Remain positive, resilient, persistent. Yeah, there are days I want to give up, but I keep going. Seeing challenges as opportunities for growth rather than obstacles. Sure, I get grumpy. Sure, I can be a bit Eeyore-ish at times, but overall, let's go. (laughs) Number six, celebrate the small wins. Don't just wait to celebrate for the big wins, whatever that means, but celebrate small wins. Each client I help or milestone that they have achieved serves as a source of motivation, reinforcing my belief in my calling that God's got me to do this in my God-given task and abilities and the value of my work. I mean, last night I said it in a bit of an Eeyore moment, struggling with uh, the work, you know, sometimes it's really hard. I said to an accountability partner last night, you know, I do have something to offer. And what I offer matters to others, and it matters to God. And then finally, number seven, as we think about motivation with our emotions, stay connected to your why and your who. It's such an important part of our curriculum, the Dream Accelerator. We're always talking about it. Stay connected to your why and your who. It keeps you motivated. Throughout my journey, I have stayed connected to my core values and the reasons originally why I embarked on this path. My why and who has helped me stay focused and motivated. A powerful example from the way of Jesus here is a story that's very familiar, maybe familiar to you as well. It's found in all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the feeding of the 5,000. Think about that story for a minute. And how Jesus and his disciples are faced with a large crowd of people who are hungry and in need of food. Think about how he put into practice all these seven steps. How he he identified um, values and goals. Jesus' core value of compassion and his goal of serving others and 
letting them know that he is the bread of life guided his actions in this situation. He had compassion on them while the disciples just wanted to send them off, let them go back to the villagers to find food. But Jesus says, no, you feed them. He created a compelling vision. Jesus envisioned a future where the people's physical needs were met. He actually prays to God using vision kind of language about blessing those who are here, serving them and giving them what they need as he thanked them for the bread and the fish. And then breaking down goals, think about how Jesus broke down the goal of feeding the 5,000 into smaller steps, put them into little groups and had the disciples go and, and serve them with the five loaves and two fish. Finding intrinsic motivators, Jesus' motivation stemmed from this intrinsic desire to be about the Father's business and to demonstrate God's power and provision in the kingdom. Staying positive and persistent, I mean, right off the bat, the disciples are saying, how can we possibly do this? We don't have enough. This is never going to be enough. Why, why, why? And Jesus remains positive and trusting in God, his Father, and in his ability to provide celebrate the small wins. Um, think of the, the joy that he must have experienced that the disciples saw the multiplication of food among the crowd. There to be a sense of accomplishment and motivation to continue serving as they came back with these baskets full after everyone had had enough. Staying connected to your why and your who throughout this miracle, Jesus stays connected to who he is, who God calls him to be, and he stays connected to the people he is there to love and care for, demonstrating God's love for all people. Let me give you a little exercise in, in concluding this uh, last piece on, on motivation. Can you identify a specific goal or challenge in your leadership journey where you need motivation today? Maybe you're a little bit uh, burned out. Maybe you're lacking the drive it's going to take to accomplish it? How could you harness your emotions using the example of Jesus and the feeding of the 5,000 to fuel your motivation today? Look at those seven steps. And then maybe write down three actionable steps, small steps you can take to stay motivated, to drive towards your goal, even though you're facing challenges today. I'd love to hear what your steps are. Share your insights with me. But if you don't share them with me, share them with a friend or a mentor for accountability and support as you take them. And then watch as the, your motivation soars when you begin to move and take those steps. Thanks so much for joining me today for another episode of Stop Doubting Your Dream. What stood out to you from this episode that you want to act on? Go act on it. Share it with me. I'd love to hear um, how this episode has prompted you to act. I invite you to listen um, to other episodes of my podcast, to explore my social media and my blog for more tips and insights on this important uh, lesson of identifying and managing our emotions in our dream pursuit. Next week, we're going to discuss why asking for help is a sign of strength, not weakness. And always remember, the journey toward your dream begins today. Take action with a single step.